guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is Tuesday. It is a talk magic. And I am here with a man I've got so much respect for, somebody who revolutionized uh, close-up ring magic, which we're going to get to in a bit. And that is Matthew Garrett. Hey, Matthew, how are you doing? Thank you very much for a nice intro. I'm very good, Craig. It's true, though. It's true. Like, you know, I genuinely think, and I remember talking to you about this years ago, when you first bought out the original Ninja Plus, you took the concept of, of close-up linking rings and you just took it in a completely different direction. Um, the thinking behind what you did is just amazing. It really is. Well, it was just by interest, really. Um, I saw a lot of different routines on stage, a lot of variety on stage. I think people have seen things like Voico's floating ring. Do you know the routine that really got me into linking rings? I'm old, you see. So it was David Copperfield. And it was the very, very slow where he just sits with the two rings. I mean, his, his whole routine is amazing. Um, and if people haven't seen it, they should look it up. That moment where he just unlinked them. But what I saw was all of these different stage routines, yet close-up routines were one ring linked to another. And that was kind of my interest, just changing it a little bit and making it slightly different. And it, it, and it, it is. And now I think it's, it's the thing that so many close-up workers perform or at least did before COVID-19. It's, it's the thing that so many people do. Um, let's, let's start at the beginning. Let's start at the beginning, because obviously, how, when did you get into magic? Was it as a child or was it a little bit later on in life? When did you? As a child, I've got those embarrassing photos of me sitting there about 10 years old in my magic gear with a dicky bow and, and doing magic. So yeah, that, I, did, I did have a start like that and just carried on with it. Like a lot of people, I found Davenport's magic shop, bought tricks now and again. And I had magicians come along to my birthday party when I was a child. And I just took to it. That's, that's great. Now, one thing that, uh, when did you turn professional, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I've been professional and then went semi-professional. Now, the reason for that was I, I did my university bit. So I, I was semi-professional at that time. And then I went full-time professional. Then I opened up a leisure centre and I was semi-professional at that time. Um, and then I went back to full time. So I've kind of dotted in between. But from the time that I finished university, it was full time income and it was always my main job. And I think as a lot of entertainers find, there were some gaps in my timetable where I was able to do other projects and other businesses alongside. Oh, great. Now, one thing about you, and I, I want to I speak to you about this specifically. I've seen you perform on stage. And you are phenomenal as a stage performer. Your manipulations you. are amazing. Uh, you've done illusion shows. I've been backstage with you when you've been, you know, doing all of the illusions. You also do uh, close-up magic. And not many magicians work on stage and close-up. You know, you tend to have one or the other. How advantageous is it as a magician to be able to be in so many, you know, to have that skill of being able to work on stage and close-up? Yeah, so a jack of all trades, a master of none, but an often case better than a master of one. So I think I think that's what I tried to do. A lot of people's ambitions in magic is to be the TV star or to, my ambition in magic was very different. I always wanted to be able to make any event succeed. So quite a strange ambition, really. But I wanted to be able to turn up. And if it was close up, perform that. If it was staged, if it was a family event, whatever they threw at me. I wanted to be able to feel that I'm going to be able to do a good performance and work in this environment. And whenever something came along that I couldn't quite do, it just gave me that little bit of interest to try and create something, try and make it work. So you said the illusions. Yeah, I've done, I, I do illusion shows, but not very many. In normal times, five a year, not really not a large quantity at all. Cabaret, yes, um, because when I do the close-up magic, I try and link a cabaret spot in afterwards. But it's again, it was just, through my interest in magic. So that's why I eventually covered all types of entertainment. Okay. And, and what do you prefer, working on stage or working close up? Hmm. Strange question. It varies from gig to gig. I think we can all relate to those gigs that we'd rather not be at and ones that we would just want to stay at all night. So if you have a good close up gig, I'd rather be there. If you have a good stage gig, I'd rather be there. I think during stage, you have less thought time because you're constantly in front of the group of people. If I'm performing close up, it might be 10 minutes and then I leave the group and I start again with another group. So for that reason, I think I perhaps have slight preference towards stage. Okay. 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 Now let's talk about competitions because you've won the magic circle 
Close-Up Magician of the Year, which is a really prestigious award to be able to win. It's a very coveted award. Can you, first of all, can you tell us how that happened? You know, what made you decide to compete? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that would be... Well, and again, it, 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 strangely enough, it wasn't with a particular desire or certainly a, an intention of winning. That was a happy accident. I had released Ninja Plus, 2007 Ninja Plus first came out and I was developing it. And it was kind of hitting a point where I knew I'd got all these great ideas and I was very pleased with it. And I wanted to hit a wider, wider audience. And that honestly is where it came from. If I wanted to achieve anything in the competition, I suppose my honest thing would have been to get the originality award. Um, but <laughs> but that, that wasn't to be, but I, yeah, I was very pleased to, to have won it. But that was 2010. So that's quite a way, while ago now. Still, no one can take it off you. Have you have you got any advice? You, you know, we've got a lot of people on this channel and they ask questions over and over again. How do you win competitions? How do you compete in competitions? Have you got any advice for how somebody who's never entered a competition before that has a desire to do so? Any advice on how to actually do really well? I think pride gets in the way too much. I think people want to win and they can't. A lot of people really have a hard time. It's not that they're, they have to win at all costs. But there's that certain embarrassment. If I don't win, I'm going to... People don't take any notice. My advice is go out there and do it. Give it a go. No one takes any notice if it doesn't go well for you, but you've got everything to gain if it goes well. So that's that's the entering advice. But as far as the... And, and be prepared to lose as well. You you can't have a... You can't worry if, someone, if you don't agree with the result or someone's won and you don't think they should. That's part and parcel of the competition. So that's just got to be water off a duck's back. Um, and then for performing, I can tell you what I did. And that was certainly not to start with anything that was too difficult for me. I want to ease into performance and to perform my usual set. As soon as I start performing things that I'm not used to, that I haven't done a thousand times before, I'm on dodgy ground. Now, when I performed in the competition, I was nervous. And I think backstage, we all were nervous. So you're learning things for close up, like not leaving your hand in the open because it can show the shakes. But if you're holding on to an object or locking your hands together, then it freezes them so that doesn't happen. And then once you build up your confidence, you just crack on as normal. So my main bits of advice would be don't be afraid to do it and, and, and do something that you're used to performing. That's very good advice. And you touched on something there, which was nerves and shaky hands. That's something that a lot of magicians have a problem with, nerves and shaky hands. Mm. What, what, do you have any advice on how to deal with that? Um, you know, uh, it is something that, especially when people are new into magic, you know, they, they want to perform, they try to perform and, and, and it just gets in the way so much. You've been in a situation where you've put yourself in some very nerve wracking situations. You performed in front of thousands of people. You performed in very high profile competitions where literally the best of the best are judging you, literally judging you. How do you manage those those nerves? Well, maybe now I'm thinking perhaps I should have been more nervous now that you've said all that. <laughs> uh, it's just a comfort zone, isn't it? So speaking to you now, I mean, we're both very relaxed and I'm quite happy to, to show bits later on to show different tricks. And it's comfort zone. And I think just if, for the people that are nervous, know that it goes. If you stick with it and you get through it, each time you'll be a little bit less nervous and, and all of those shakes and things like that, they just go. And now I suppose I've widened my, my comfort zone. That's all it is. So whether it's a big cabaret performance of thousands of people, I wouldn't expect to feel nervous there. But if you threw me out of my comfort zone and you put me into something that I'd never done before, then I could feel nervous again. If you asked me to sing a song, I never do karaoke. That would make me feel nervous. But so long as it's part of your comfort zone, like all close-up performances would be, and then with my stands, I've, I've widened it so I'm happy to show any magician's tricks because I've done it thousands of times. All you're doing is just through constant repetition, you're making everything that you do part of your, your comfort zone. Okay, that's, 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 that's really good advice. Now, I want to circle back to talking to you about yourself as a creator. I mentioned at the very beginning that you revolutionized ring magic, you know, and you really did revolutionize this. Mm -hmm. For anybody who's watching, we do have a lot of people that are on this uh, channel, subscribe to this channel, that are very new into magic, that might not have even heard of Matthew Garrett. As you said, you released the original Ninja Plus 10 years ago. 
Could you talk us through that routine, maybe even show us the routine and the thinking behind um, kind of how it came to be? Would that be okay? Sure. So rings, as we know, starts 2000 years ago in China. Um, then there became Shufagawa, who, if you haven't seen or heard the name, look him up. 2004, he released the Ninja Rings, which was a routine by another Japanese guy called Masahiro Yanagida. So Shoot performed Masahiro's routine with permission and blew everyone away. And what it was, was a routines that were using, oh, I need to stand higher, that was a camera height, so there you go. So these, these rings, and they're four and a half inches in diameter. And the nice thing about them is you can do these really precise lengths. So it doesn't look like anything's happening. And in close up, this is great. They disconnect. And as you carry the routines through, you're getting people to hold on to rings. So as we're outside and they're holding on to rings. And of course, in the course of the routine, they're examining things as well. So this really changed, I think, the linking rings and brought it down into a close up environment. And if you've not seen Shutagawa perform that routine, I would say, look it up. That has to be the starting point. So where I came in with all of this was I'd learned Shutagawa's routine. He spins them on a table and he's got a really nice start and, and he's so technical. Everything he does is, is spot on. I was wearing a ring on my finger, just uh, jewelry bits and, and a neck chain. And it was, it was where it came from. I did that. That was it. That's how it began. And it looks nice. And I thought, there's something here. We can go somewhere with this. And then I learned to do this, to take it off onto the finger. And I remember how I learned that, that technique as well. I was performing at a magic job where there were no guests. So I was booked all day um, and I was perform performing there, but there was no, but I had so much free time in the day and I had these in my pocket. I just loved to play. And I think that's how a lot of people create magic is through doing this. And then I had the idea of it going through to my finger and I was thinking about the mechanisms that it would work. And throughout the course of the day, I got it down to about the speed of that. And then I changed the technique so you could join it in the hands and that can be done in the spectator's hands as well. So it was all of these different techniques that I was picking up along the way and learning. Then came along this. So this is now examinable. And this idea, Brian Caswell helped me with this. He filmed all of my DVD projects and he's helped me with not just the filming, but what ideas are looking good on camera, how we can change things. And he was helping with the process of the gimmicks for these as well. But this Ninja Plus gimmick, from the time that this came along, this was the big changing point and this was the, the creation of Ninja Plus. And the revolution is that for the first time in Close Up Magic, you could take a ring, join it in front of them with no switch and immediately pass it out for examination and that's just something that didn't exist before and for me it just got my mind thinking and it was just play time it was just i'm sitting with the rings and i'm working okay i can i can disconnect this i can join it on it goes out for examination and i can do this surrounded and ideas just kept flowing and kept coming such that i started off releasing volume one when murphy's bought the the first load of them and then when they sold out, I'd had enough ideas. I was like, do you know what? When I do the new order, I'm going to release a second volume on the DVD. I've got more that works, more that I'm using in my current routine, and I want to share it with people. Then we sold that batch, and then they wanted more. And um, Shooter Gower would had come back over. He was performing in Blackpool. And we suggested the idea of how about we put some of our ideas together. So Shoot came over and is interviewed on it and he performs all of, so he's got all of his techniques on the volume three. And then we did the same again, same process, Matt Lamotte, who a lot of you mentioned the magic circle close up, he's, he's won that three times. Um, and he's on volume four of the DVD doing all of these things. So it's kind of been this creative process that's just gone off in different directions. And for me, um, the close-up linking rings is not just about one ring joins to another that joins to another. Now, I love the old school performers such as Richard Ross, who's got that elegance of taking the rings and his style that brings it to, and Jeff McBride, who performs with the power. But with the close-up, what I wanted to create was variety. So changing the objects. So rather than just one hoop joins to another, I would join anything I could find. 
Uh, if a lady's got a handbag, I have to borrow it. I'll link the handbag on. See you later. It's, it's a bit of fun. Um, polo mints. I've joined it. And I'll join the polo mint through and it's teeny tiny. It joins through. I disconnect it and I'll go and make the mint disappear and it's, it, it, you eat it. It's just a bit of a way. Uh, using the rings as a vehicle to use everyday objects into your magic and have fun with people. And I would use the smoke gimmick a lot with the magic because you can do the nice bits where you melt the rings on and the smoke comes out at the time. So when you start putting all of these things, ties, gentleman's tie, I'd link it and I'd let it, the tie go and it pings back and it looks, it looks fun. So it just made for me, rather than, uh, I think people saw rings as being cliche magician, just boring, one ring linked to another. But once you break free from that and you realize what you can do, Anything with a gap in it, you join. You start having fun with things. A wristwatch, I borrow the wristwatch. Now instantly you can do magic with wristwatches. So even if you don't do a watch still, you've got that nice image that people are seeing of, his, of the wristwatch going up. Bangles that girls wear, incredibly wide, but I've got techniques of joining the bangles through. So instantly and I use, because it's all metal, you can use flash string and you can light it. So it was a way of me getting fire into my routine in a safe way. So instantly I've gone from having a, one ring joins to another to including everything fire smoke borrowed objects jokes on the way through and it, it just rolled and the ideas kept coming that's, that's 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 absolutely amazing and that is a perfect lesson in creativity right there you never want to stop working on something you know if you just stopped when you had the idea of linking the ring on then we wouldn't be where we are right now um it's it's I'm, great I, think, I, I just think about it way too much so people say I'm obsessed with rings. It's true because I'm either working on the products to send out on the stock side of thing, which is almost a daily task anyway, um, or I am thinking constantly about what else can I do next? Where is this going to go? Um, the other day I was helping someone with a social media video to create something different with, with rings. So it's got the variety in it. Um, Ninja Fusion. Do you, do you remember? I don't know if you performed the interview. Yes, no, the interview you... with, the, with the ball bearing. I was going to ask you about that next. Yeah. Yeah. So that came along. I wanted a slow melt. So with the rings, it's quite a fast. Sorry, see where I put this. It's quite a fast motion. So you're here. And what I wanted to do, I wanted to create something that instead of having that, I wanted to create something that was really slow. I don't know how this is going to look from here, but let's go for it. My inspiration for this came actually with the golden key. You know the, um, you know the effect called the golden key. You take a key and you move the end of it across, and you slowly move it, and it goes. And I liked that idea. I wanted to try and achieve something similar, and this is what we come up with. So they can examine this beforehand. You can sit here, but you get this really slow melt through. So rather than be a fast link, and you show it all of the way around. And it's an object that you can then pass out for examination. So you can take it and they examine it and you can show instantly it moves. It's got a lot of fun bits to it. Um, you, you'll see trailers for it as well. And a lot of the simple moves that you use with the rings are great. So I'm sure a lot of the magicians will work out what I'm doing here, but instantly they've taken this back. You've taken it back. You can start to move it. That looks great. And, but everything I've just shown, people will be doing instantly it's not a difficult effect it's just a very slow and when i do the slow melt i like to use smoke at that moment because i like the special effects of it going through so it's it's a very different way of performing and then let me just show you something else excuse me i've got different bits around let's go with this there we go so i'm doing my routine i come into here and then once we've joined on fusion i join my different ideas together so come on you must do you recognize who that is craig any ideas uh, mickey mouse <laughs> no it's donald trump but thanks for <laughs> now you're, you're 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 exactly right yeah mickey, mickey mouse is who you're supposed to think it is or if we add one of these on the end there we go we'll put that around there and then we've yeah. got uh mini mouse <laughs> no it's still mickey he can wear what he wants he shouldn't have <laughs> <laughs> so it, but this is the thing it's a way of having having fun with the routine and it's it's no longer your standard generic linking rings routine um you can put different jokes with it on the way through and it just flows and it, it's different than other routines they're going to have seen you do before 
It really is. And, and I think that that's the thing that strikes me. If you go and you buy from you like the Ninja Rings, the Ninja Plus, the, uh, the Ninja Fusion, you, you've got the four volumes of the DVDs. You've literally, you haven't got a trick. You've got a, a virtual encyclopedia of knowledge in terms of you'll never need to have anything else again. Because there's so much there. There's so much that you can learn. And I think not just, learn, so they learn all the routines straight away. So if you want to learn a basic routine, you can be doing it really, really quickly. In fact, when people come to my scans, I always make sure by the time they've left, they can perform it. So it's, it's one of these things that's quick to learn. But I like the fact that people can see what suits their style, whether they've got a comedy style or whether they want to use the fire or if they work in restaurants, I link it on bottles. And if you want to link it on people's foreheads, you've got all these choices that you can make for what, what suits your style. And, and, and that's a way to go for it. So Ninja Plus was all of this thing with um, joining a, a finger ring, the small ring on, and then instantly passing it out for examination. And then I wanted a way of being able to do a similar type thing with the close-up rings. But the problem with the close-up rings, as we all know, with the normal sets that we use, is there's always the moment you don't want to give the key ring away because... You, you know, you've got to be a little bit protective, haven't you? And, and I'll be honest with you, that's the thing I, I, um, that, that magicians, it makes magicians wary of using the rings. And you know, you, I, I do your routine an awful lot. That, I, I, I remember at Blackpool, because you obviously were dealing at Blackpool, you had a dealer stand. I remember at Blackpool, um, the, um, there was some, I met some magicians and they were like, oh no, we never do linking rings. We think it's terrible because of the key ring, blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay. If you remember, I brought them over to watch you. I said, watch this guy. And they bought everything. And I think the fear that magicians have is, oh, I've got this ring with this hole in it. I'm not going to be able to pass it out. Oh, people know about rings with holes in it. It's not a practical routine for the real world. And watching you perform it and understanding your thinking behind it, nobody would think that was anything um, sort of dodgy about anything. No, thank you. And, and as you say, there are techniques that you can use anyway. Now, I've just joined the ring. And from here... That now goes straight up for examination. What? So, what? so what I've just shown there is a different technique. And this is the new effect that I've got GIR. And hang, honestly, on, hang on, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa here, Sparky. Let's not gloss over that. Uh, is it really? That, do that again. I'm sorry. No, do that again. We'll, we'll, we'll add another one on. So you have to tell me if I'm holding the, the things right. So they link. You can go through. You can hold what? And, and this is the great thing. At each stage as you go through the routine, this is examinable. They can examine now, or you can disconnect off. And they Hang can on a minute. Examine. So you, you can link those together and then hand them out for examination in their really, little stage. As clearly as I can, there are no gaps, there are no breaks, it's all examinable. And that's what I wanted to create, this thing with the close-up rings where people haven't got to worry. And you can combine them with the other routines which is great, or you can do them without, but it just takes all that heat away. There's, there's no gap. I, I'm lost for words, and anyone <laughs> who knows me, I'm, I'm blown away, Matthew. I mean, I've always considered you to be not just an expert in general when it comes to close-up magic, but the ring stuff that you do is just phenomenal. That's, that's impossible. That, that, how would you, you know, from a creativity point of view, I, mean, I want to talk more about this product and where oh, people can get it from because you, what you have right here is a game changer. You have a um, game changer. Do you realise how good this is that you've got? <laughs> oh, my God. I, I love it. So for me, oh, it's, I, I could say, what do I prefer, this or Ninja Plus? It's a close call. I like them both because they just bring such different things to it. But, yeah, I realise it's, it's a strong item. Um, I think you say, how, how did you come across things like this? I've spent a long time researching, so watching a lot of these old school performers that go through, and I came across a DVD set by Levent, and it's amazing. It's mainly on a stage rings. He's got four DVDs, and he talks you through the routines, and he's shown you performers from the past. He's shown you the history, and he's bringing these ancient routines to life. So if anyone's not seen that, they should. So really trying to when, when you specialise in a field, you suck it all in. You try and work out everything that's available to do with rings, whether it's the sand guy who takes the rings and makes it disappear, or if it's Victor Boyko, who is the first person to shrink, or the first person I saw to shrink the ring smaller. You, you learn all of these different things, and you see the techniques, and you try and run with it and come up with more ideas of your own. 
So what, what's the new product called? It's called G-I-R, Garrett's Impossible Rings. And, and where can people get it from? Is it available everywhere or is it? It's available, it's available now. So if they search for it, they should be able to see it straight away. Am I allowed to give my direct link to myself? Absolutely, of course, that's my, please do. That's my preferred method, of course. Absolutely. Um, professionalmagic.com is my website, and you'll see the product section there. Or you can go to ninjaplus.co.uk. Either of those will take you through to it. And what you get, if you already own my four rings, you just need to buy the expansion set. So you buy the GIR expansion set. But if you don't have my set of four rings, by the GIR set, it comes with everything. You get six rings in a set, and you can perform well everything that I've just showed you with with the with the hoops there and and more. So yeah, and I've got additional products on there, of course, such as Ninja Fusion with the ball and Ninja Plus that uses the, the finger ring. And is there a package deal on there if people want to really delve into your brand of super visual ring magic? Is there something where they can buy everything and have just access to all of it? I've got different package deals on there for different combinations of my tricks. And it is explained quite clearly on there because you see exactly what you receive in each set. So everyone can be clear on exactly what they can purchase with it. And there's tons of videos on the site down the bottom as well. It's what I do, it's what I enjoy. Didn't you, didn't you bring something else out as well uh, just before lockdown? Uh... Bring in bottle? Yes. So that was with Michael O'Brien. So actually, I haven't put it by the side. But I will, it, as you can imagine, it's a ringing bottle. So where this came from, I was, I have things that I do with wine bottles. When I work in restaurants, I'm often resting the finger ring on top of the wine bottle and I'm linking it on. And sometimes the spectators would assume that the ring was going to end up inside the bottle. And I hate to disappoint. And I knew that that was what they're thinking, it's going to end up inside the bottle. So then, of course, I had to create a way that that can happen. So the effect is exactly as you would expect. They examine a the ring, they examine the bottle, no, no, no. You push the ring inside of the bottle, they examine it again, you go dum, 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 and then you, whenever you like, you take the ring straight out of the bottle. So you can do it on its own, exactly as I've described, or as I do it, I then carry on with my Ninja Plus routine. They all kind of, you can use them on their own or they blend together. And I would always do, the four rings routine whilst I'm doing walk arounds. And then when I've got people seated at the table, then I would get them to hold their hands up and I'd put the ring into their hands and do all of the stuff at the table. So it's, it's versatile. Right? So here's a question, like you, all of your ring material that you do, it's not just a trick, it's an act. And it's the act that you use to you win uh, the magic circle. Do you have time when you're in a close-up environment to do anything else? I mean, you've got all <laughs> awesome material. I, I just imagine you going around to table to table, just doing ring and, you know, amazing stuff with rings and then walking off. Or do you actually do, because I know how skilled you are with other props. Do you use other props anymore? Still, uh, virtually every table at every gig, they will see me do something with rings. Of course, I perform a wide variety and I perform other effects as, as, as everyone but the rings is what I specialize in. And I like to push the boundaries when I perform. And what I mean by that is I'll sometimes try more and more complicated routines and I will do a routine flawlessly. And then if I miss one move, I'll take it to the point where the moves get hard enough. And if I miss one move, then I'll go back to what I know before. But by having that practice ethos, it's let me push my boundaries again. So it's let me be more comfortable with harder moves. So some routines just are very simple, but we all like to practice harder stuff at times. So that's what I would do. That's my way of learning it. And that is the nice thing about your material. You can learn the basic routine. And then if you get one of those tables where everyone's just like David Blaine style reactions, you can go, right, okay, let me try and throw this in and see how this goes. Yeah, and as well, it's not like if people see me do rings at one table and someone else is seeing me doing it, they don't get this feeling, oh, look, he's doing the same old trick over there because it looks entirely different over there. Um, whilst I was with this person here, maybe I was using Tom Brooks' bar blade routine, which is where you take a bar blade and you join it on. So we, we performed that with kind of permission from Tom as well. Uh, and maybe over on this table, I'm using flash string and I'm lighting stuff. And maybe on another table, I've got someone with a ring on their head and I'm linking it on there. So the point is, it's to a magician, it might look like the same. It's the same learning technique. So you, once you've learned something simple, you can dress it up in a very different way. So they're seeing something entirely different over here than this table I've just seen, but it still uses the rings. That's great. 
Now, I want to change subjects, still on the subject of creating. Um, I do a Q&A every Sunday on this channel where people ask me questions. And um, one person asked me, what's your favorite storytelling routine? <laughs> and I said, it's Monty the Spiv. Is that right? Monty the Spiv? Monty um, the Spiv, yeah. yeah. And I, is the, I, I had several people say, is this available? Where can I learn it from? Because for me, it was like Sam the Hellhop, but a better story. And also, you put some manipulation in there. You put some flashier moves in there, which I think just, I, 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 honestly, I think it's the best storytelling routine that there is out there, bar none. Well, thank How Freddie, thank Freddie Lowe. So there's, there's history behind these different things. So storytelling decks, it doesn't date back to me. Um, Monty the Spear dates, dates right back. I think Hannah, Harry Stanley put it out in conjunction with Freddie Lowe. So that's what, and before it was Monty the Spear, it was called Tui the Barman. So these story decks originate over time. And the American one, as of course you said, everyone's, I'm sure, seen Bill Malone, an amazing performer, performed Sam the Bellhop. Um, Sam the Bellhop, Bellhop's not an English word. The 468th Street, it's not an English way of... So my point is, spiv is an old-fashioned English word that I'm sure most of your viewers are familiar with, but you know, a bit antiquated perhaps. But it's, it's an English story deck. So for me, when I'm performing here i want to use things that make sense so that's where it's come from so the original story deck it, it's not mine it predates so it goes back to, to, to freddie low and it's it's in a yeah it's a set deck routine and the reason i love these things is it's a chance to fit your personality into a routine so and, and i see jokes with story decks where people because it can be monotonous just naming cards as they come off the deck we're now going through to the ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, queen, king club. It's a chance to put your personality into a, into a routine. So if you um, can create something, I like to spin the card in the air and, and catch it. And I have them applaud when I do that. It's just if it's the right time, it's a way of asking people to give you a clap without directly saying, please applaud me now. It's, it's setting a challenge for yourself. If I complete this challenge of spinning the card and I catch it, then I would like you to, to clap and stamp your feet. So I am asking for applause, but I'm not asking for applause. And if I want the applause to go loud with clapping and stomping of feet or, or raucous, then I can control it to go in that direction. And if I want it to be polite and not make so much of it of a time, I don't have to. So the story deck for me is just a vehicle to get my personality into a routine. And you can cut the story short if you want to, you don't have to do it all the way through, but ideally my requirements to perform a story deck is I want them to be able to hear me. I don't want to be in a venue where the music is too loud for that. And ideally I'd like to think I've got at least two minutes of their time so that they're not gonna cut into speeches or things like that are gonna happen. So I pick my times carefully and you just require a teeny tiny space that big to put cards down on the table. And apart from that, you're away. Um, I have got some different, bit. I can show you some different ideas from it. So yeah, let's go oh, yeah. off this. So this is a thing, this is where you can start the story deck. So if I hold those up, you see it's just deck of cards in order? Yeah. Now, I'm holding this up now for, for long. This is the, uh, a new deck order gimmick. And this was based on the Deland card. And um, what you do is you, you get rid of the Joker and you get rid of the two guarantee cards. And now I'm into my set deck. So these cards are not in deck order. OK, right. so although I showed the cards in deck order, they're special gimmicked cards that are called the new deck order gimmick. And they make it look as if the cards are completely out of the box in order. And all you need to do once you've shown it is to get rid of the guarantee cards, which are gimmicks. And then you're you're away to do your story deck. And for me, I like that because I can take the cards out of the box. It looks like a new pack. They're exactly as they're supposed to be. There's no heat tonight. They're just in deck order. And now when I'm shuffling the cards, it gives that idea of more skill in there. It adds something to, to what I'm about to do. And that gimmick's also useful if you were using, if all the cards were blank or if it's a one-way four deck. no matter what your gimmick is, it's a way of making the deck look normal before you begin. And so the history of this thing, um, I saw Daryl, the magician's magician, um, perform using the Deland card, and that was a way of forcing a card. He would hold a similar display up, get someone to look at a card, and he would thereby be able to work out what card they picked. Okay, So that is the way I start the story deck off. 
Now I did change, so I've got, I'll show you the carbonate bit because I know you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Um, carbonates generally people think of for stage, but you can do, I'm about, well, this is as unforgiving as you can get. I'm, I'm sitting, here we go. I think that's about as close as we can be. There's, but you can still get carbonate to look quite nice, even if you're up close. And there's a 4 a bit. Phenomenal. That looks great. That's about, I don't know how, how much it flashed. I'm just sitting in front of oh. them. You appreciate my camera is this far away. So you're right on top of it. So that is less forgiving than a live audience would be. But you can do carbonate that far away from people with a few cards. And in amongst, in a criteria of the story deck routine, it's giving me, the story deck for me gives me permission to show off with a deck of cards. I think when people sit there and they start doing fancy cuts for no reason, unless it's part of your character or his dynamo style, I, I get that that's his, his style and then you can get away with it. But without building up or having a reason to do it, just sitting doing fancy cuts with cards, it's a very strange thing to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But a story deck routine where you're having fun and I'm gonna spin this card, we're gonna catch it, we're gonna clap and you're having fun with the audience. You've kind of built your personality story deck routine in together and it gives you this permission to be able to show off a little bit and do whatever moves you know. And I say to people, if you can spring the cards, do a spring. They're going to love it. It's a way of finding the joker. I'll spring the cards and I'll catch the joker over here. If you can't do a spring, it doesn't stop you doing the routine. Just don't do a spring. Do whatever move you know. So it's a way of all these moves that you've always wanted to put into your routine that you've practiced. And you go, well, I, I, I love this move. I've learned it. I never use it, but I like the move. By using Story Deck, you've just giving yourself permission to do any move that you like because it's just part of this i'm going to find your card and here's how we're going to do it so for me it's a way of breaking free like that another thing i did in the story deck routine was a way of guessing his age so I've, I've gone through and i've talked about this chap who goes off um and we're gonna work out how old he is so craig give me an age so if you said 47 i have to find a four and i have to find a seven how old do you want him to be um 32 32 so i stand up here and we didn't set that up by the way because that, that's quite a nice one for me actually but there's 32 that's great yeah. now all this is um i'm allowed to talk through methods on here i'd say oh, yeah, yeah 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 absolutely so i got to a point in the story deck routine where i changed the order of the cards slightly such that on the bottom of the pack i've got five six seven eight nine so if you gave me any numbers with those in it i can just with my thumb i can just count down to whatever you said so it's very easy for me to find and on the top of the deck i've got all of the other numbers that i can thumb count down to so i'm just counting them down here so on the top of the deck now i've got two six three so it's quite nice i came from the top to get two six three so that was the three and then i can turn them over together and then i can put them down and show the two um all of the numbers that I need at the top are there ready to go. So it goes two, six, three, five, eight, seven, three, four. And I never need to go further than that. And on the bottom of the pack, like I said, I've got five, six, seven, eight, nine. So using that, I can find any age that they give me very quickly. That's Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. The only ones that are excluded, and this is nice as well, if they say a number with a one in it, that's already gone past and I cold cut to the nace. And all I have to do is to lift a few cards up because the aces are all together in a pile right near the top. So again, it's, it was a fun bit for me of breaking the story deck up and just saying, okay, give me an age. How old do you want it to be? And I'll find that age using the cards now. And that's what we do. And I think when people learn story decks, they have this idea that it's going to take me oh, a couple of weeks to learn the order of the cards. And people are surprised that when I do a lecture, the last five minutes of the lecture, everyone in the room learns the order of the entire deck. And um, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? it yeah, does. it, it's not because there's a story that holds it all together. And all you've got to do is remember the bits of the story and you know the order of all the cards. So it actually, and if you forget, you've only got to look at the card as you're telling the story and put it down. And then it gives that idea that you're making it up as you go along, which is fun too. So you, you, you can't go wrong with it in that sense. When I, um, so I first released this over in America and it got lovely reviews over here. And then I remember, and I knew it was always going to happen in America. Someone compares it to, to Bill Malone. So that's, that's the thing. I'm not Bill Malone. <laughs> I'm not an American magician. I'm not selling it. So I think people have got to realize 
what it is uh, and what the DVD is about. It's about an English story deck and it's about how you can adapt it for your own personality. If you want to be Bill Malone, he's great. But that, that's the difference is if you like between the most obvious product comparison and this. Yeah. And I think that you have to stamp your own personality onto it. You know, whatever you do, you don't want to be just doing exactly the same thing as the person you've learned the routine off. I think that yeah. um, yeah. I mean, as, as I came about, I mean, I, I learned the original Freddie Lowe version of the trick and I played with it and I made some changes to it. That, that's exactly what I did with it. And that's available on your website as well. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wanting to spiv. Excellent. So here's a question for you. You've, you've mentioned lots of names and you've spoken about lots of people. Who were the main influences on you as a creator and a performer? Are there any particular magicians as you were coming into magic that were a big influence on you? Absolutely. So let's go back to the start. So the magician I mentioned when I was um, very young, six, seven years old, who came out to my house was a magician called Leon. He has since passed on. Um, but yeah, that would have been an influence seeing that. And then I was very lucky because the late Richard Stuppel, um, who was previously the chairman of the Magic Circle, helped me and I went along to a lot of his shows and watched him perform. So a lot to thank him for. He certainly um, gave me a lot of encouragement and I learned a lot of the techniques along the way that, that I use to this day. And then past that, with regards to the rings, I, I, I guess it would be a couple of the names I've already mentioned. So seeing David Copperfield, that, that got me uh, excited by it. And then Shooter Gower has been absolutely incredible in everything he's helped me with the rings along the way. Because Shoot has, well, firstly, given me permission to use the name Ninja Plus because his product was called the Ninja Rings. And he was happy with the association of the two products. And his, his help with it, I mean, he, you know, performing on the DVD. And, and so he, he's been amazing with it and, and instrumental. But I've had a lot of different performers along the way that have come in and out of the different projects that I do. So um, with, well, I mentioned volume three with Shooter Gower, volume four with Matt Lamotte. On the Ninja Fusion product, there were tons of different ideas. So Lewis Joss had this idea of using the PK ring in association with the ball. So he had moves where you'd take the, the, the ball off the ring and it would instantly fall off. And he was using these techniques with the PK ring. Simply not what I did, but it looked great. Tom Brooks was using this bar style and a really sort of forceful style of, of linking the ball on and throwing it off, whereas I was using this small melt. Uh, Michael O'Brien from America was doing the crossing the gaze move as he gives it out, which added nice elegance. And there was a guy, Seong Jin Lim from Korea, who had got a very nice elegance with his techniques of showing the ball and linking it very clean. Um, Ollie Ward was also on there and Ollie uh, did all these great changes between a coin and a ball, which was a nice way to introduce the object as a ball as you go in. And I think that by collaborating with all of these people, you add so much more to it. You, you run with these ideas. With my last project with the GIR, um, two Norwegian magicians, Mike Hill um, and Brian Husset, came up with a lot of the ideas and the techniques that we're using now as well. So I came up with these concepts and had the initial bit. And it's like, let's run with these ideas. Let's try and take them further forwards. So it's not just performers I've known from when I was young that have influenced my magic. It's upcoming performers who have got really good at the rings that can help me develop it even further. So would you say that it's really important to develop relationships with other magicians, especially when creating? You see a lot of, because of the age that we're in with the internet, you see a lot of people getting into magic and they never meet other magicians. You know, they just stay online forever. It, it, does that, yeah, I know it's kind of ironic talking about human contact in the middle of a pandemic, but that, that human contact, that meeting up with other magicians. Well, there's this danger you see with creating tricks. The danger is you pick the wrong person and they steal the trick from you. So you go to someone and go, I've got this great idea for a trick. Look at this. And the next thing you know that. So I think you have to be sensible and careful. Show it to the right people. Pick the right people to help. There's no one, no point in someone helping you with a routine that doesn't specialize in that area. Well, there, there might be if they can, you know that they can add something to it. But my point is you're not picking random people you're picking people that you know that can add something to that particular area that you're you're studying so yeah. yeah i think with any creative process working on my own i wouldn't have been where i am i needed initially brian caswell's help 
with 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 the products and filming it and and yeah that that was invaluable there's a lot of different people along the way that helped me to get it to where it is and, and without that creative team and force i mean always you see it don't you when you see the, the people who are producing things for the tv series whether it's dynamo that you're looking at in fact any of them troy they're not doing it on their own they're brilliant performers and they've done really well but they need a team and it's that team that talk and come up with these ideas and work together so your collaboration yeah, yeah vital vital absolutely so here's a question have you finally before we wrap this up have you finally done with the linking rings is there literally anywhere else you can go with them? I mean, surely this new product is the holy grail. You can now do the linking rings without a key ring. Surely there's nowhere else you can you go must, with you, this now. You must, you must look at the trailers because please realise that what I, I've just picked a couple of random bits that I've kind of just shown you from here with what I've got lying. That it, it, there's a lot. There's a lot more to it. So watch the trailers is, is what I would say. Uh, no, so I've achieved what I wanted to achieve with the finger ring joining and instantly out for examination. And I'm pleased I've now been able to create that same moment with the normal rings that you can join them and instantly pass them out. So it's all examinable. Yes, I've got more ideas. <laughs> how, how can I not have? Um, I've got some ideas that might not be practical. I've got some things I'm, I'm working on. Um, it, it's what I do. Um, and it's it's multi-dimensional like i say it's not just a, a rings oh god just another ring joining to another ring that's not what this is about ring and bottle that's not really a linking rings routine it's a penetration effect of a, of, a, of a ring going through a bottle but it's a very different type effect but it links in it connects to all of the other routines i can use them together if i want to yeah that makes sense and and outside of ring magic What's next? Uh, what, 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 this is a question I ask everyone I interview. What's on the bucket list? What's next? Because I'm going to tell you this, and, and you've had an amazing career, and the career's not anywhere near over. <laughs> uh, but you have. You know, you've done stuff that magicians would only dream of. You've won the Magic Circle Close-Up competition. You've released probably what is considered one of the top products in magic ever, um, you know, that completely redefined a genre. And then you've done it again now. Uh, you know, and you've had an amazing career. You've performed all over the world. You know, the, 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 most people that are watching this would have, could only hope to have a career like you've had. So what's what's next? Um, thank you very much. Um, I mean, as far as careers go, I probably got somewhere in the middle of the ladder. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's people at uh, different, different points. Um, regarding the rings, yeah, and there's still more. So that's definitely, so, so first of all, my, my aim with the rings, would be that mine are the go-to routines that people don't uh, to, to the, be the best in the world at the close-up linking rings would, would be the aim there. Regarding other pieces of magic, so just recently I put Jeff at Bride's Bikos into my routine. Great piece of magic, you know, the best ever knocks off silk. That so I'm learning. Where you just tie it and it comes, it's beautiful. Uh, so I, I like visual magic, um, particularly now um, so, so the rings, again, being very visual, when we're in these COVID times, they're pieces of magic that work for us. So they're, they're very performable. And, and if you are talking about things that are, oh, you're not necessarily going to give them out so much, they can see them. They can see that there's no gaps in the rings. So it still works. It still functions and that. And with things like Bcos, I mean, it, it, again, all of this stuff that I do with the rings and with Bcos, it fits in your pocket. It's lightweight to use. You can put it in your hand luggage if you want. And yet you've got those routines ready to go. And um, when I was performing a lot of these times, it's been visual magic that I've done from a distance. So learning more visual magic has been my, my, my thing at the moment. Well, the thing is, a lot of magicians at the moment are performing virtually. They don't have a choice. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, the, the ring routines that you do, they work perfectly in a virtual environment. Yeah. They look so good. Yeah. And like I say, it's not just one ring linking to another. So if you're doing a virtual show and you're using different objects, find what objects link in with it. There's tons that you can do. That's fantastic. That is amazing. Wonderful. You know, Matthew, uh, it's like I said to you when I first spoke to you, I really wanted you on the, uh, on the show early on because you've been a very big influence to me. I perform, as you know, very, very regularly the... Uh, all of your routines. Yeah, uh, you, you do them very well. Well, thank you. 
Um, I remember learning the Ninja Plus routine. I'd never done anything with Ninja Plus before or Ninja Rings or Linking Rings. I'd never done anything. And I remember um, having it for the Wizard Product Review. We're going way back to now. And I remember Dave turning around to me and saying, so you're going to do this on the show? And I'm like, I don't have to do Linking Rings. And he's like, okay, here's the product. So I literally just spent a week in my house just watching the volumes and like, right, okay, I, I can do this. And, and then I had the stress of having to do it on the show the first, the first week. But that was a big moment for me because of that. You're, you're very nice in the program. I, I remember it very fondly. You gave it the work with a week and I believe you gave it 99%. So thank you very much for that. And I was invited back on the show a few times to show as these editions came along. I was back on your wizard product review showing, showing the latest versions. Absolutely. So that people should look that up as well. The old clips I'm sure will still be there. Yeah, they are. And you know what? I'd like to revisit that grade. Having now worked with those rings for, a, uh, you know, for almost a decade, I'd like to give it an extra percent. It should have been 100 <laughs> percent. Um, but no, it's please carry on creating, Matthew. Magic needs more people like you. Um, you know, for those of you that don't know Matthew, he is a genuinely nice guy and uh, super talented as well. So thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been good fun. It's been nice. I hope people have gained something from it. They, re they really have. And guys, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'll be back tomorrow with Ryland with Magic Review. Uh, we'll even, at, at some point, hopefully, we'll be able to review your uh, your, your new item. What's I know you, yeah, G-I-R. I, I know you've got the new item. So I hope that, uh, not just yourself, I hope Ryland has, has fun for me as well. We're going to have a fight. Me and Ryland are going to have a fight <laughs> as to who gets through. Because he does the ninja rings. Like, it's his favourite thing to perform. He does ninja plus, he does ninja ring, he does your whole thing. So when I tell him Matthew Garrett's got a new thing coming out and it's to do with rings, he will literally fight me to get that. So I, I have a feeling he'll be the one performing it, unfortunately. But I look forward to seeing it. We'll have to see. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll be back tomorrow with Ryland and uh, I'll be back next week on Tuesday with another Talk Magic. Guys, thanks very much for watching and uh, I'll see you again soon. Bye.